Let's go ahead and, um, and pray. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together today, and we ask and pray, God, that um, our, our hearts and our minds would be receptive and open to the teaching of your word. We ask and pray that our, um, our mind would not be high-minded. And Lord, that you also help us not to be afraid of correction. Lord, because um, you, you discipline those that you've adopted. Um, them were your daughters. You don't just heal your daughters, you correct your daughters. You don't just affirm your daughters, you correct them. And you do it to make us everything you designed us to be and to build our families and our lives and our homes and our relationships and our personalities up to code. We ask that you go before this teaching and really um, do the work you need to do in our lives for your glory, for our good. Lord, affirm things that need affirmation and, and rebuke us if we're just high-minded or self-willed or comfort us if we're wounded, bandage and bind up the wounds. Clarify confusion, Lord, when maybe we've been taught a certain way or our personality does something, it really does contradict our new man and we just go, I don't know how to break out of this. Lord, we thank you that by your word, your servant is warned, and in keeping your commandments, there's great reward. Father, we lift up our husbands, our family, our children, grandchildren, roommates, parents, and we ask that you move by your Holy Spirit among the sphere of relationships each of us have. We pray you'd help us to love people around us, help us to be merciful, and Lord, we pray that people around us would love us and know how to support us as well. And Lord, we ask and pray, God, that um, your kingdom would be further as a result of us gathering here today. In Jesus' name, amen. As a reminder, I don't take questions during the teaching because we're recording it. But if you have questions, write it down. And then when we do our homework next week, make sure you get my attention and then we'll talk about it, okay? Um, okay, so open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. This week, we're looking at the woman Jesus corrected. Luke 10, we all love that. 38. Luke 10, 38. Now it happened as they, Jesus and his disciples, went, he entered a certain village. And there was a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. I know a lot of women go, oh, not the Mary and Martha thing. <laughs> it's like, why does my husband only know the verse that she is a continual dripping? Why can't he memorize any other verse? <laughs> okay, but um, we love God's word, and we're so thankful that he points out um, common pitfalls for the female gender. And it doesn't mean stereotypically that we're exactly like that, but we have those propensities built into the way that we are fearfully and wonderfully made that he so kindly, gently, and firmly addresses so that we can shed some of the um, natural instincts and become supernatural beings. Um, we are dealing specifically with gender accounts in this Bible study. We're looking at encounters Jesus Christ had with women. Because as much as there are so many things that are universally common among all men, all ethnicities, all you know, both genders, um, there are also unique things in every culture pertaining to um, female and male roles. And sometimes it's different in different cultures. Um, but there are some things that are addressed in the scriptures that are universal among the way that God has designed women. And this particular encounter I really enjoy because he only deals with women. He deals with two sisters. He deals with, with uh, gals. And it's kind of fun to watch him deal with them, I think. And you know, women's retreats use this section of text a lot. I think this is probably the most taught section of scripture I've ever done at a million places. And I've never grown like weary of it. And I've always looked at it and went, shoot. Or like, dang, or oh, I'm getting better at that. Or no, I still do that. And so it's, it's, it's just like the mirror you have in your bathroom. You know, oh, that's the same mirror I looked at yesterday. We look at the same mirror again and again because there's something new we have to work on. <laughs> Some new black hair growing in a place we should never get. <laughs> so in Luke 10, 38, it, it says again, it happened as they went that he, Jesus Christ, entered a certain village. 
And this certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So Jesus was traveling and was welcomed into this house. Notice it says Martha welcomed him into her house. Now her husband's house, again, we have another woman here that doesn't look like she has a significant other. We don't know whether she was married at one time and he died or she never got married. We don't know. But we know that Martha is always her and Lazarus and Mary are, are like a group of siblings that, that have a great relationship with Christ. Um, their home is built upon the Lord. And um, it doesn't look like she's married or has a, the father in the picture that's still alive. She seems like she owns this house, whether she inherited it or she earned it, we don't know. But she was um, you know, prominent enough to be able to have a home that's large enough to bring someone in and their disciples, as well as we'll see there was a Bible study going on in this house and it could host people. She also had enough money to be able to buy food and serve the disciples and Jesus, unless they gave her something from the offering they had. But she was a pretty competent, um, affluent, uh, well-known, uh, self-sustaining woman. And she welcomed Jesus into her house. And Jesus received that. He didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I only go into men's homes and people that are, you know, are elders in the church. And you know, he, he received her hospitality and it was safe for him to, to come in there. Um, she, um, she was given to hospitality. She welcomed him into her home. And that word welcomed, it means, I have it somewhere. Oh, it means to receive someone under your roof hospitable, hospitably. It means you're not going, uh, I guess, if no one else can, or okay, well, he is the Messiah. You know, she didn't have that kind of attitude. She had an attitude of, 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 of graciousness and receiving um, him into her home with a um, excited, welcoming, I'm happy to have you here. In Romans, and keep your finger in this loop because we're going to stay there. In Romans 12, 10, Paul instructs the Roman Christians. He says, you guys need to be kindly affectionate to one another, Romans 12, 10, with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another, verse 11 of Romans 12, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to these of the saints, and finally, in verse 13, given to hospitality. We wouldn't have to be instructed in this if everybody just did this naturally. Um, some of us have our safe zones, our boundaries. Um, we have our ways of doing things, and we don't want people to come into that rhythm and mess it up. And some of you have a gift of hospitality. Um, the Holy Spirit has given you hospitality and you, you sense the Lord wanting you to be used this way. Others of you were raised in cultures or by your mother, you know, father, you know, like, you, you know, I hear a lot of, just, especially in the Mexican culture, that homi casa is su casa, is, is tender. Poor people, you can have the last, we'll make it go further. You know, that in that culture, that's just woven in there. It's beautiful. And, and others of us <laughs> were raised in different environments where, you know, each man to himself and that's not my problem and we have ours and that's helping someone, you know, be dependent on others and, you know, all of that has elements of truth. But really, we're to be given to hospitality. And um, it's something that if we don't have that naturally it, and, and we don't have it as a gift of the Spirit or we weren't raised with it, it's still a command. And we have to ask the Lord to help us to be much more given to hospitality. By the grace of God, I, I get to stay at a lot of people's houses when I go to teach places. Sometimes they give me hotels, and sometimes somebody has a gift of hospitality, opens their home, and they give me their guest room. And you know, so far, by the grace of God, I've only stayed at places where people have that gift. So <laughs> you know, I can't imagine really without it. But I watch it, and I just, I'm so impressed, because I, I don't believe I have the gift of hospitality. I believe I obey the command to be hospitable. I don't think I have the gift. Um, I'm commanded to do that, and especially a pastor and his wife are really supposed to be that way. You know, we're supposed to be casa su casa. So you learn from the Holy Spirit to be that way. But I know that when I go to someone's house and they really have that gift, it, it goes beyond just what cute flowers are next to the bed, or you can sense a welcoming spirit 
there and and you really do feel like you've almost been temporarily adopted into that family and it's beautiful and when it's the holy spirit too it goes beyond just an ethnic propensity towards being hospitable there's a graciousness and a sense of peace and welcoming that goes in that that it, it's really something beautiful and martha welcomed him into her house she gets a bad rap because when, where she ends up but she starts out great. She welcomes him into, into her house. And you know, she, she's a great example. And you know, she was probably a very organized person. That when they were coming through the town, she was ready to welcome somebody into her home. It's a great quality in a woman of God. Proverbs 31, 27 says that a virtuous woman watches over the ways of her household and she does not eat the bread of idleness. To be able to welcome someone into our home, our homes need to be in order. They, they, that's, we don't keep our house in order because a guest is coming. We keep our house in order so a guest can come. And our children and our family are more important or on the same level as a guest. And if we only make it clean when company comes over, we're communicating to our family that they're really not that important. And I know that we get lazy in our homes, but our homes are the first place that we need to love and serve people, is our homes. And Martha must have kept her home very orderly. Now I know some of you have small children and you, you, you feel like you're getting, you know, are you kidding me? I'm just trying to, you know, get the diapers changed. I'm not talking about, a, there's seasons in our lives as well. <laughs> okay, because you know, sometimes you, know, you just can't because you're just trying to not, to get sleep, but I'm talking about overall and the standard that we can keep at the different levels of, of the seasons of our lives. We as Christian women are to reflect a God of order. Just because we're comfortable with it doesn't mean it's God's standard. God may be saying, no, your dishes should be done. Your children need to do chores. Your home should reflect my nature. You're actually lazy. You're not just not worldly. And sometimes I'm like, well, I'm not worldly. I don't care how my house looks. Well, Lord, the noble, noble description, but probably not true. <laughs> no. Like, it doesn't mean that we have to live up to a worldly standard. We're going to see that Martha slipped from being hospitable and welcoming to actually having a standard that went beyond God's standard. And that's another danger, isn't it? Some of you are raised in homes with your mother that had things so in order, no one was welcome there because they would mess up the order. So there's a balance. Have enough order to be able to invite somebody in but don't have so much order that you want to keep people out. Only God can give us that righteous balance, can't he? And we have to, we're going to see that she kind of went over on that end. Um, we need to treat our families and homes, even if we're single, ladies. You live alone. You deserve order. Make your bed. You're, you should come into that bed at night and feel taken care of. Because you're still the keeper of the home, even if you're the only one in there. And, and I, I, I think it's so important. I remember I, a dear friend of ours uh, that went here years ago, Evelyn um, Hoffman, she had lived alone for years. Uh, she was an older woman, she lived alone, and she, she was just sitting around in the apartment, she was a teacher, and then she realized, um, she was, you know, I should buy a house. And she, and she always felt like she shouldn't buy a house because she wasn't married, she, she wasn't able to have children. Um, she had a hysterectomy when she was very young. And she thought, well, I'm just going to be this lady that lives in an apartment as a teacher and I won't ever make a home because I can't get married. And one day she realized, why am I waiting for a husband to make a home? And she felt like the Lord really let her buy a home and make a home. You can be a maker of a home and a keeper at home without a man there, without children there. You can be a mother to everybody who walks into your door. And she went in, she bought a house and she made the house and... She, it was, it was beautiful, it was a nice home. Beth, did you ever go into it? You know, we would go in her house and she'd make tea and make us feel at home and she did end up marrying later. And, um, and then her husband died, they both went here. He's the one who started our homeless feeding and he died. And I remember within a week after he died, this is just an interesting story, <clears throat> Evelyn called me and she said, okay, Morris is with the Lord, so how do I get involved in the singles ministry? <laughs> She was like that fast, like, well, now the Lord is something new for me. And she just zipped over there, and then she opened her home to the singles group to come. And she made a home. 
So, you know, Martha's an example of welcoming Jesus and his disciples into her home. She didn't have to fit in with the typical Jewish um, success story that you're married and you have all these children. We don't read of any children that Martha ever had. And Jesus went there. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we grieve over the children we wish we had. Infertility is something I don't understand, but I've seen people struggle through it. And, you know, she kind of said, well, I don't have kids. I'm going to open up my house for Jesus and the disciples. She was able to do that. I know a friend of mine, she's never gotten married, and she's past the time of having children. And, you know, she's grieved over that, both not being married, not being able to have children. But she's a special ed teacher, and she has, like, 15 severely special ed kids from ages um, 3 to 5 years old in her classroom. And she loves them and buys them ice creams and takes pictures with them and gives them presents at Christmas. And, you know, I go, I told her, I said, those kids need that energy and that love. You know, you, they need someone who isn't dividing it between their own children. Like, how precious that you can do that. And she's hospitable with her lot in life. And so Martha re really does receive from us, should receive from us some commendation that she welcomed him under her roof with joyful attitudes. In verse 39, she had, back in Luke there, um, she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. The also there, I believe, means that there were other people there listening to the Lord teach, and Mary was there as well. Um, Jesus was teaching within her home. There's a neat example of like a home Bible study. I know Melissa has a, a home Bible study at her house. And raise your hand if you've ever had a Bible study at your house before. Look at how common that is. I mean, just so many people open up their homes. Might I encourage you to always be open to something like that, even if it's not an ongoing one. You can't make a weekly commitment. You can just do one. Hey, we're going to go through Psalm 23. And maybe you don't have the gift of teaching. Say, everybody, I'm going to assign you each three verses to come and share on it. You know, let's, let's be creative. Let's welcome Jesus and his teaching into our homes and, 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 and bring them in. Verse 40, it says, but Martha, but Martha, she was distracted with much serving. I want to remind you that only the women are highlighted in the story. Here we get a little picture of Martha. She welcomes him in. There's this Bible study going on or this teaching and Jesus is doing this, and Mar Mary is listening. It says, Martha was distracted with much serving. King James Version says, cumbered about. I, I prefer the King James one because it just feels like what happens to us sometimes, huh? We're just like cumbered about, just overwhelmed. It means dragging all around in the Greek. Overoccupied about a thing in the Greek. Overoccupied. I like the word distracted as well. Distracted from what? From what was really important, what was needful, and what Jesus thought was a higher priority. She was distracted with much serving. Not serving, with much serving. In this Greek word, it's translated ministry and service for the Lord in a lot of other places. And this word much means abundance. See, Martha might have been doing more than what was really needed for what was going on. Maybe she slipped from hospitality to performance. Maybe she slowly got into worldly standards. Oh, it's the Messiah. I gotta have the best this and the best. It doesn't get that specific, but we knew she was doing a lot. She was doing, I'm sure, what she thought would be the best. You see, hospitality is supposed to be rooted in caring for the one who we, whom we welcome into our homes and lives. We're actually supposed to think about what would bless them. And she probably thought this is what would bless the Lord. How many times do we decide what blesses the Lord without asking the Lord what blesses him? And he's like, I don't want that. I don't need that. You're, you're looking at things like he told Peter. You're mindful of the things of men and not the things of God. You're thinking what a person would think is important is what God thinks is important. And they're not always interchangeable, are they? It, it's, it's like sometimes, you know, a husband can buy all these things for his wife. And, and she goes, if you would just pray with me, 
that would mean more to me. He's like, what? I thought women, what times do I, I want to pray with you? Or, you know, a child, you know, the mom's doing everything. But mom, I just want you to play Hot Wheels with me. Like sometimes we think we know what somebody else wants. And in this case, I would venture to think that Martha was predicting what he would want based upon what does my culture do for a guest of honor? Our culture can be wrong. And we have to get that through our heads as well. We have to be in a place where we say, you know what? I need to find out what Jesus would be blessed with, not what I think Jesus would be blessed with. We can become covered about with much serving. In Proverbs 15, 16, we learn that better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. It's better to have a little of something and you're, just, you're focused on the Lord than to like make all this commotion and get involved and do this and that. It, then, then trouble. Verse 17 there says, better is a dinner of herbs where there's love than a, a big old barbecue, a fatty calf with hatred. How many times we make a tremendous meal and our attitude, get out of the kitchen, I'm making that. And, and, and then the kids are all like, I don't want to eat it. <laughs> it's this girl reminds me of, is, is my mom barking at me? Or it says better, you know, is a dinner of herbs. When you realize you're stressed, you don't have time to put everything together. Maybe we don't have to put it together. You know, maybe we don't have to make homemade coquitos that night. You know, it's hot, the air conditioner broke. You don't want the oil, uh-uh. Maybe it's just the time for microwave quesadillas and everybody is happy because mom's happy and not stressed out and then mad that nobody thanked her for all her work. And the kids wanna throw up everything you just cooked because your attitude just polluted the delicious meal. And God clearly says better is a dinner with herbs than a fatted calf with hatred. That's why we don't push onto situations our standards for things. We don't um, fight for, like, why is, you know, our, our husband has to take us to a certain restaurant or we have to buy a certain house and we strive to get it. And then we yell at each other because everybody's working so many hours to try to make the mortgage. And the Lord says, it would have been better for you to stay in the apartment and just have love with each other than to strive to get something I never led you to get because you think you should have this at this age or that age. I'm 55, we don't own a house. And you know, I would like to, I've prayed about it for a long time. I've been, I've, we've owned houses in the past, but it, I've never, the Lord just doesn't open that door. And I'm not gonna believe the lie like, oh, we're a failure, we're 55, we don't I, I just kind of, well, we don't own a house. But you know what, we have peace, we have a great view. <laughs> I, I like where we live, I'm okay. You know, like I don't want to live by this world's standards. It rips us off of what God's doing in our lives. It doesn't mean we can't have goals, but may they be what Jesus wants for us and not us making it happen. It is better to have the fear of the Lord and love than trouble and hatred and tr you know the treasures with that. It's always good to evaluate in our lives the much serving. Are we striving too high? Is there pride? The pride of life is a dangerous thing. But can I encourage you guys not to judge one another on that? That you don't know somebody's heart. And when they put out their best china, they may not be doing it to impress you. They may really be doing it to bless you. And so don't, don't do that. You know, I, I've been judged like that. I remember somebody said, oh, I don't wanna go to her house for Christmas. She decorates her house, just so everybody knows how she decorates. I'm like, what? I, 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 I didn't know that. I go, I go, well, I'm still gonna decorate my house because you know what, I pray before I decorate my house and I think it looks pretty and that's kind of a gift God's given me is to decorate, so I use it. You know, it's what I like to do. And no, I didn't spend a lot of money on it. I'm not doing it to impress anybody. And, and just because that's the reason you would do it doesn't mean that's the reason somebody else is doing it. Shh, Martha, Martha laughs loud on the recording. So, it's so curious, full of joy, I love that. But it's one of those things where somebody hears a recording and goes, what is that? So, um, is, is there pride? And are our expectations rooted in love or are they rooted in self? You know, are we, are we having standards in hospitality because you know, we can't have anybody over until we paint the room or until we buy this, until we do that. 
You know, I've been in very humble homes I've stayed in. Um, it's not always the rich people with the huge homes. Sometimes it is because they have the room and the money to do it. But I've been welcomed into modest dwelling places that are just full of love and very clean and very precious and, you know, um, it really, you know, nothing like worldly standards, but full of dripping with love and with hospitality. So we don't want to be those people who, who live according to those standards. Was her much serving rooted in pride? We don't know, but we're challenged by that. And see, why am I doing what we're doing? That's why we should always offer everything up to the Lord, even if we're doing it for a person. We say, Lord, you know, you know, I encourage all of us ladies, when we go to cook, bow your head before you start cooking. I say, oh, Lord Jesus, I just offer this up to you. I pray that my children or my family or my roommate or me would just you would be blessed by this meal. And I do it unto you. And, and, and do it kindly and not get frustrated, throw things around the kitchen. And this is not what we want in our homes. We don't want to be cumbered about with much serving. Going back to Luke 10, 39. <clears throat> and she approached him, she approaches Jesus and she says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So Martha approaches Jesus. He, she interrupts his teaching. She thought <clears throat> what she was doing was more important than what Jesus was doing. She was insensitive to what Jesus was doing. She was so wrapped up in what she was doing, she just had this, this, this tunnel vision. It's what I'm doing and what I'm doing for the Lord. This is a mighty ministry and I'm gonna pull everybody into this. And you know, She wasn't thinking like, you know what, other people, Jesus is doing something, I'm doing something. We run our lanes, you guys. We should run our own lanes. Everybody doesn't have to be in the children's ministry because you're in the children's ministry. Everybody doesn't have to be in the pro-life because you're in the pro-life. Every, we don't, you know, we don't interrupt somebody else what they're supposed to be doing because we need help. God needs to send us help if we need help. And we don't put a guilt trip on people because they're not involved in it. And she kind of put a guilt trip on Jesus. She, she, she wasn't sensitive to what he was doing. You know, when we are covered about with serving and tasks and goals, we might miss out on what Jesus is really doing. Like so many, I remember one time I went on a mission trip and there was somebody from the other country we were with and she was a very strong-willed woman and she was very outgoing, which I have no problem, I'm kind of outgoing too. But she was determined to steer the mission trip in, in directions that she had already decided it should go in. And there were times that we could, all of us could just sense that the Holy Spirit was doing this. Like all of us could just see it. But she couldn't see what the Spirit was doing because she had in her mind what Jesus should be doing. And it, it, it ended up as unnecessary conflict. It was really nice though. I wasn't in charge. The pastor was in charge. I didn't even say anything. And the pastor saw it. And the pastor goes, look, you're quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit because you're deciding what God's supposed to be doing rather than observing what God is doing and going in that direction. And as women, you know, we are planners and we do get things done and, and that, that really blesses the world in which we live. But we can also be headstrong and high-minded and we try to force Jesus to get involved in something that he's saying, that's not what I'm doing right now. That's not what I'm working on right now. And we, we actually end up being like Martha and we say, you don't care for me. We start misinterpreting his love for us because he's not doing what we think he should be doing. If we have more respect to what Jesus is doing and less trying to tell him what he should be doing, we're gonna know he loves us more. We won't question it. Because she presumed what he would do if he really did care, she thought he didn't care. And you know, when we are watching and evaluating other people and what we think God should be doing, we're gonna be tempted to come to the very wrong conclusion that Jesus doesn't care for us. And it's, it's, just, it's just not true, and it's really arrogant, and we're too loud. We're too loud in our minds. We're not able to perceive because we're too busy, busy planning. We're not able to observe because we're too busy doing. Um, stress can be a time for, in all of our lives where we, we interpret God's concern for us incorrectly. When we're overwhelmed, we aren't always receptive to God's love for us, even though he loves us because all these stresses are loud in our lives. And, and we, we're thinking, you don't care because you're not stopping my stress. That doesn't mean he doesn't care, it just means we're stressed. 
The disciples thought this during a time when the pressure was getting to them. Do you remember during the storm in Mark 4, 38? They said, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? So it wasn't just a woman thing. The, the, the guys thought that too. Um, a natural response, but an incorrect response. <laughs> we will think that at times and be patient with people who go through that. They're learning of God's love. He goes, she goes, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Don't you care what she's doing to me? Blame Jesus for what a person was doing. Don't you care that my husband did this? Don't you care that, that this happened over? It, why is Jesus blamed for people's mistakes? Which Mary wasn't mistaken, but she thought she was. I, I don't understand. I sat, I was talking to an atheist a while ago, a precious friend of mine. And he was just, you know, going, well, why would, you know, this person rape this person, and this bad thing happen, and that bad thing happen? I go, well, why is that God's fault? Why is God blamed for these? Why don't you get mad at the people that are doing these horrible things? Why? Well, he doesn't stop it. You know, and I, you know, it led to a whole other discussion. But let's just talk about the fact that sometimes we blame God for things that people do. It isn't nice. It isn't nice at all. I remember uh, sometimes people blaming me for what my kids would do. You know, and I get it when they were little, I'm in trouble. When they get older, I'm sorry. You know, they're on their own. They answer for themselves. I've taught them right and wrong. And now they have a choice. And I'm not going to take responsibility for my children's choices when they're adults. They are big people. They have lots of options. They've been out there. I'm not going to receive that. Nor should we blame God for what people do or what, you know, Christians do. Um, you know, she was serving alone. She's in her own little world. Ever been in your own little world? She probably didn't even ask for help. She was just expecting her sister to get up and help her. You're gonna get frustrated if you and I project on people what we think they should have done. You guys use your words. <laughs> You're like, look at you, use your words. <laughs> use your words. You know, we make our little, when kids get kind of braggy and they don't want to talk, they, mm -hmm. but use your words. Like we're teaching them to communicate rather than just express frustration. We're doing that so when they grow up and they get married and their husband says what's wrong, they don't say nothing. They tell their husband what it is. And sometimes we go, well, you should have known. You should have shown up. You should have known that I needed that. You know, use our words and communicate things with people. She was expecting her sister to offer, and she wasn't doing the serving with God's help and God's presence, else she wouldn't have used the word alone. Ladies, we are never alone if Christ is in us. And we don't have to feel alone. You know, sometimes I, I, I probably, this is a mistake in my life, I realize now, it's a little late now, but I, I, I rarely had my children ever help with dishes after um, eating. Because it was like my time with the Lord. I go, 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 go do whatever you want to do. I'll clean, no problem. Because I go in the kitchen because nobody really wanted to be in there anyway doing it. So they'd leave me alone. And I could, you know, I have four small children. It was my time to kind of pray, do the dishes, put things in order because things are never in order when you have four children. And I, it was my chance to just accomplish something while dad was looking at them and they were playing over there. I'd get up from dinner and I'd go do that. I love that time. I never felt alone. I never got mad that people weren't helping me do the dishes. Now, I didn't train my children well because of that. So I did err on that side because I'm trying to do that now that they're adult children. It's not working. So I, I made a mistake. So I, I, I erred. But you find those things out. But even to this day, I prefer just leave me alone in the kitchen. Let me clean it. And I put on like some music, either with the Lord or some dancing music. And I have fun in there. And it's a good time for me to be in there. I don't, but I don't feel alone. I feel like the Lord's with me. And, and Martha said, you've left me to serve alone. We are not alone, you guys. It's a time you can pray about. You go, I don't have time to pray. Yes. While Martha was in there, she could have been praying. You, there's things we can do. We, we don't work alone. And in Mark 16, 20, it says that the disciples went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Her sister, you know, should know her place. And her sister needed correction. Martha had it all figured out, by the way. And you know that when she was in there, she was thinking about this. Why isn't she helping me? 
she should be there. And who is she to sit, you know? It's dangerous to play out scenarios and to presume why somebody's doing what they do. She could have just done the service to the Lord and been grateful to take her place in the ministry. Um, you know, 1 Peter 4 and 9 says to be hospitable to one another without grumbling. You know, if I can't do it without grumbling, I shouldn't do it. Just leave it alone. Walk away and repent. So, you know, and I'll tell you what I found compensates for grumbling is giving thanks. You know, when I'm doing something and I don't really want to do it at the house, I'll think of something like, wow, I'm healthy enough to do this. Or, wow, look at the view while I'm sweeping. Or, oh, look at my dog. Thank you for PD watching me do this. You know, like just something I can find to give thanks. It takes away grumbling pretty quickly. Proverbs 31, 13 says that a virtuous woman works willingly with her hands. We're not trying to get out of labor. A godly woman is busy with her hands in her house. She's not sitting around just using her phone or trying to figure out how to get out of work. How can I procrastinate? She she's gets up and she gets the job done. It, 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 it's a little bit of a lost virtue in our culture, but it's a biblical virtue for women. So Martha did understand that it was important, but she wasn't really working willingly with her hands. She was working begrudgingly with her hands. Back to Luke 10, 39. Shoot, I'm only at 62%. Okay, therefore, tell her to help me. This is great. If you loved me, you tell her what I want her to do. This is a bad prayer. This is not a good thing. Let's not do that. When me is the focus, we get bossy, indignant, and a tizzy. And Proverbs, she was being a contentious woman. Proverbs 21.9 says, better to dwell in the corner of a rooftop than in a beautiful home shared with a contentious woman. Proverbs 21.19 says, better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Now, we all agree with that, and I don't think it's just for men. I think when we get like this, we don't like to live with us either. We're like, how do I get out of this mood? How do I stop it? You know, it, we don't like it either. So it's true even to live with ourselves. Perhaps she should have sensed her mood, or that she was overwhelmed. Did you know what? I'm gonna leave it, I'm gonna sit down and listen to Jesus. Or you know what? I better not, I better go outside and pray and then come back in. She shouldn't have gone to the Lord and told the Lord what he needed to do for her. I think she lost the hospitality thing. <laughs> it's now what you're doing for me, not what I'm doing for you. Verse 41, and Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you. I love just the first three words. Martha, Martha, you. Martha, Martha, you. You don't care for me. Tell my sister. No, Martha, Martha, you. You, and I love what he says. He doesn't really get mad at her. He diagnoses her. He kind of like, look, let me just tell you what the real problem is. It's not that Mary's not helping you. It's Martha, Martha, you are worried and you're troubled about many things. He shows he cares because he sees what the real problem is, not the lack of help. It's, it's the way she's thinking. Her mind is in the wrong place. Her heart is in the wrong place. It's not really the work you're doing. You're worried. That word worried means that you're anxious about this. It's becoming a production. It's becoming the most important thing going on in this house when it isn't. It's, you know, we can do that. Women can just be weird like that, and we have to recognize it. I think this was put in here so we could see it in someone else. It's always easier to see it in somebody else than ourselves. And go, mm, you know, especially with the holidays coming up, this is a great one, you know, for Thanksgiving, for Christmas. You know, we try to get everything so perfect, we actually contaminate the beauty when we know that it, it's the fun, you know, like, what is that movie everybody watches where they went to the Chinese food restaurant? On, Christmas Day, the Christmas story. Yeah, they all end up eating there because the dog ate the turkey, right? Ran off and all that. But you see them as a family, I know it's just a movie, but it gives you a visual. They ended up making a memory. They didn't have the perfect Christmas dinner, but they laughed and enjoyed and, and enjoyed each other because that was what Christmas was about, was being with each other, not the turkey, not the china, not, it, that wasn't what it was all about. And, um, we should look at what we are, we're, we're, we need to keep the main thing the main thing. If we're cooking for our family, guess what? It's about the family, it's not about our food. Um, verse 42, he says to her, one thing is needed. 
One thing is not many things. I love how it went from much serving to one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part. And it will not be taken away from her. That's a whole other study about Mary. We're just looking at Martha. But I like it. It says Mary has chosen. It means she thought about it. Do I help my, my sister? Or do I sit at the feet of Jesus? She made a choice to sit there. She wasn't ignorant of the work that was done. She chose, she weighed the priorities. She knew her expected role, but she came to the conclusion spending time with Jesus was more important for her and more important to Jesus. She didn't just get caught up in cultural or earthly dynamics. So you know what, she has chosen the good part. Martha, what I have for you is more important than what you have for me. And what I want to feed you with is more important than what you want to feed me with. I have what you need. That which will help you not be worried or troubled and change your personality. And it won't be taken away from her. I'm not only not going to tell her that, I'm going to guard it for her. It's a great verse there for those of us who have a hard time meeting with the Lord and your kids and demands. And you know, he said it won't be taken from me. It's, it's there. I know it's there. Um, you know, she, he just basically says, she's important to me. And I'm serving Mary. So I'm not going to do it. We can have a sense that our little sphere is of the utmost importance, but it's not the highest priority. It's his sphere and what he thinks is important. Maybe you're supposed to turn off that movie, put away that phone. Maybe you're supposed to just uh, not have that expectation, lower it and do something else. We really misrepresent Christ to our families, to our homes, when we become Martha's with what we're trying to do for them turns out turning them against the Lord and we repulse people in our family. Our husbands don't want us to do that because you, you and I are difficult to live with when we do that. Martha did grow in this, by the way. I have to give a little, you know, spoiler alert. Um, she just needed some correction. Uh, the last verse we're going to look at is John 12, 1. We can move away from that verse. She did have the gift of hospitality. She had to refine it. Some of you do have that, but you, you get you know, a little fleshed out a little over here and you have to bring it back. Um, she just, she, she had the gift and she did grow because a, a few chapters later in John 12, 1, it says six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead, who he had raised from the dead, he came to where he was, uh, where he had been dead, who he raised from the dead, verse two, there they made him a supper. And what does it say? And Martha served. So she's still back in the kitchen, but she's not, she, you don't see her with the same attitude. So he didn't take away her gift. He didn't rebuke her for doing it. He was concerned that she was a person who was too worried and troubled and did much serving. He was, he was refining it. Look, just serve the Lord. Don't get caught up in production. Don't interpret that I don't care for you because things aren't going the way you think they should. And you're not alone. I'm with you in that kitchen. I'm with you putting that together. You know, sing, enjoy, serve. Take your hands and willingly serve your family, not begrudgingly. And do it knowing that that pleases the Lord when we do that. And remember that sometimes you can just order Taco Bell and, 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 and to be able to get to church on time on a Wednesday night and have to make this huge, if, if you're called to midweek service, you know, you can do it lighter and still get the food and, and make it a higher priority. And don't slip into even Christian peer pressure among women, that everything has to be, you know, like the, um, what's that lady that's on the cooking channels, pioneer woman or whatever. You don't have to be her or whatever. It used to be Martha Stewart when I was younger, but now we don't talk about her. But you don't have to do it that way. You know, we can work willingly with our hands, make sure that production isn't the priority, and, and to realize that we make the choice of whether we're gonna be worried and troubled about many things, or whether we're gonna serve the Lord in humility, and, and also, it would be neat for Martha to be thinking how neat Mary needs to hear from the Lord. Like, that's why the people that work sometimes in the infant room or toddler room, you know, they, they go, you know what? I'm going to hold those babies to give those mamas a chance to go hear the Lord without distraction. Uh, I'm going to give them a chance to choose. They're going to have a choice because I'm going to go ahead and serve over here. So they have a chance to sit at the feet of Jesus. Lord, thank you for this example. Thank you that um, you are kind enough to correct us when we need correction. And thank you that we see Martha kind of, you know, growing beyond this. 
and it gives us courage to take correction and know we can grow. May these truths really enter into each of our personalities and the way we conduct our lives and the different homes we live in, whether we're married, single, moms, um, wherever we are at, that Lord, it would work into our lives and we would not be cumbered about or distracted by much serving. We wouldn't be worried and troubled about many things and we wouldn't think that we're alone and we wouldn't think you don't care for us. But Lord, we work willingly with our hands and we use hospitality without grumbling. Thank you for preserving this very womanly kind of scenario. And it really does hit us in things that our husbands would be like, what? Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't get it because they don't care about the cooking and getting everything done sometimes, but we do. And thank you for addressing it and giving us an example and helping us see the better choice. In Jesus' name, amen.